I'm here today with Stephanie McGarrell, who uses the handle Stephlophagus. Stephanie is a health hero and will share her story of using keto and intermittent fasting to lose 150 pounds. She's been featured by Jason Fung and in December was in Women's World Magazine. Hello everyone, I'm really happy to be here today with Stephanie McGarrell. Welcome Stephanie, how are you doing? Great, got my Canadian coffee. I don't know if you have Rampage there in Bermuda, but it's delicious. <laughs> Yeah, no rampage here. I do have my coffee beans, yes. Um, but thanks so much for being with us today. You know, it's so wonderful to have health heroes on this kind of show that I do. And really, when I see someone that's had a transformation like you, and, you know, I've been following you now for, it's probably over a year, I think, since we initially touched so. base. And I said, I just need to reach out to Stephanie to really find out a little bit more with her, but have her share her journey. Uh, because everyone's coming now, you know, into the new year. And they're looking for some steps that they can have for success. Mm. So Sadi, tell us a little bit just about you. Sure. I am just a very small town girl from southern New Brunswick, Canada. And uh, for as long as I can remember, I literally just was always the big kid. Always taller and bigger than all my friends. You know, I didn't know what it was like until in my 40s to be able to borrow or share clothing from anybody. It just it didn't happen. Um I think I remember encountering one person in university who was wearing a plus size and I could borrow one thing, but really I was just always the big kid. But I also, I think it's just who I was. I never really, I never tried programs. I wasn't someone who said, oh, I tried Weight Watchers. I tried Jenny Craig. I, I hadn't done anything. I just was who I was. Um, I lived confidently. I didn't seemingly let my weight hold me back. But I think it did. Uh, it was more so the health issues I had from birth. We didn't know until eight years ago that I'm celiac and lactose intolerant. No idea. So I grew up on cream of wheat with milk in it. <laughs> um, <clears throat> always wondered why cereal made me feel sick. Constant ear infections, constant sinus infections, polyps, antibiotics all the time, teeth problem, like tooth problems because of stomach reflux, vomiting, just a whole lifetime of upper respiratory and stomach issues hospitalized when I was nine. And then, you know, I just kind of went into my adolescence and adulthood obese, very obese. And then, you know, it wasn't until 2017, um, a string of events had happened. I was still recently postpartum with my second baby. I was on um, hormonal birth control pills. I was 330 pounds so many things were going on. My inflammatory markers were really high. I had unexplained uh, inflammation and mobility issues. So my inflammatory markers were high because of that as well. And then I broke my foot. And a month later, I unfortunately suffered uh, a deep vein thrombosis in my right calf and severe bilateral pulmonary embolisms. So here I was 330 pounds with children less than one and three. My breastfeeding journey was effectively done because I couldn't be on the blood dinner and keep doing that. And so spring of 2017, St. Patrick's Day, actually, <laughs> I was not drinking green beer. I was lying in a hospital bed <laughs> dying and uh, I spent a week there. And honestly, a good six months of my life passed where I think I was probably just in a bit of a trauma state, days, anxiety every day. If I couldn't get a deep breath, I thought I was going to die again. And then fast forward those six months, I don't know exactly why or what happened. Maybe some seeds were planted in my mind, but I couldn't move. I couldn't get my own compression socks on, which are hard to do in a good day, let alone somebody else with rubber gloves trying to put them on, <laughs> on blood thinners, on about seven prescriptions, anxiety, steroids, birth control pills, just so many things. And then I overheard my sister a couple of times kind of laugh um, about a local doctor friend who had said, you really should check out dietdoctor.com because she was frustrated with her weight. Um, so ultimately she's just not really a fan of keto. It's not her preferred route. She's a triathlete, so she fuels her body differently and that's fine. But I kept thinking in my head, what's this diet doctor? And I thought it was just a gimmicky website in my head until I went to it and fell down you know, the rabbit hole <laughs> and um, came upon Dr. Jason Fung then of course that led me to youtube started listening to things he was explaining about the two compartment system and why we store fat versus burning fat and it all just made sense and so i flashed back to 2012 when actually the 
ear, nose, and throat doctor had been the one to stumble upon the celiac. And I remembered that when I was eating, I guess you could say paleo-ish at the time as part of the diagnostic process that I had felt better and that I was also losing weight, but my joints didn't hurt and squatting at the gym didn't hurt. So I started thinking about all this and it just all came together. My husband and I sat together on our anniversary in September of 2017 and we said, this has to stop. It's not good. You know, he was pre-diabetic at this point, in, in part because of medication. I was obese. I wasn't well. I couldn't move. I couldn't get my socks on. I was medicated to the hills. And we just said, it's got to be the food. So it took a little bit to get that ball rolling. At first, I was really resistant to even use the word keto. I was strongly against it. I didn't want to say it. I didn't like labels. Um, it's like people who say, oh, that's my, my mate. And they don't want to say boyfriend. And I was just so against the label. And I think part of it is because I had never done programs and maybe I was holding back because I didn't want people to assume that I was only successful because of this thing and not my efforts. And, and so I finally let go and didn't worry about the label. And I mean, within two weeks, I was having mobility returning. Um, within the first 90 days, I was down 50 pounds. And I, I, I'm telling you the complete truth when I say, you know, when I found my why, it wasn't even the weight per se. It was the fact that I couldn't move. I, I just had no quality of life, no mobility. Getting down on the floor to play with my children was not even possible. And I just was so sick of it. I was sick of the prescriptions. I was sick of the fact that I was back on stomach medication when I had previously come off of it after the pursuit to celiac diagnosis. And I was just tired, physically tired, mentally tired. And I just woke up. I literally woke up. And then I bought Jason Fung's book, The Obesity Code. I bought The uh, Complete Guide to Intermittent Fasting. Um, I sunk my teeth in. I, I chewed that steak. I ate the meat. I spit out the bones. I took what I could from it. And I just, I couldn't stop. I just kept reading and watching YouTube videos and listening and taking it all in. And it all made so much sense. Um, a year after that, I was I was interviewed by Diet Doctor and then got to share my story with the local doctor who had no idea she had inadvertently played a role in this whole thing. So she was excited for me. I met her on the playground this summer and told her about the Women's World article that was coming out. And so it was just kind of this whirlwind, you know, three years had gone by and here's this woman I met and said, you know, you really helped start this whole thing and she had no idea of course and so I think that's how transformation stories will often go my story may have impacted another woman to completely change her life also and I may never know that but it's just so fascinating to know that we have the power to influence other people to change their entire health and Jason Fung like I mean I owe I owe the guy my life <laughs> really I know I did the work but his wisdom and the way he presented the information made it all just make sense to me. It's so inspiring to hear you, you know, Stephanie, to share that experience. And I can tell your heart because you've been transformed and that ability, that want and desire to like watch the YouTube videos and kind of read and learn. And I've often said to patients, I said, if you put as much research into buying your new television, than you did into researching your health, could that not transform your world? So tell us about Jason, because a lot of people don't know about Dr. Jason Fung. So um, Dr. Jason Fung is actually Canadian. He's a board certified medical practitioner. He's a nephrologist. So basically my understanding of his past is that here he is somebody who specialized in, in kidney disease and late stage kidney, stage three, stage four kidney disease. And it got to the point when he realized they all had something in common and that was obesity and or diabetes and so instead of saying okay let the people get to me at end stage kidney disease and I'll just treat the symptoms he said no there has to be a better way so he started researching obesity and finding out that obesity was a hormone issue um and that by re resetting our our leptin and ghrelin so our hunger and satiety hormones and our um, insulin, we could reverse pre-diabetes, type 2 diabetes, slow down progression of kidney disease that was already present in these patients, instead of just meeting them at the late stage part and making them more comfortable until the end, you know, and so 
he has committed so much time and effort and research now. He, they have, he and Megan co-founded a program in Toronto, Canada for, it used to be called Intensive Dietary Management Program. It's now called the Fasting Method because ultimately he came upon, you know, realizing that between low carb and fasting, it was literally curing people and, and changing their lives for the first time in their entire life of pursuing change but stumbling upon the fact that obesity is not an issue of we don't move enough and we eat too much, you know, the whole eat less, move more concept. And he debunked that. So he started basically becoming a myth buster when it came to the context of calories in calories out. And that's just not how it works. And when you're dealing with obesity and obese patients, it is a hormone issue. And it's not about what we eat per se, but how much and when it's the timing of when we eat also because time restricted eating is a game changer. Yeah, it's wonderful. And like you said that the concept, you know, and I'm a medical doctor and so many of my colleagues still believe that eat less move more works, but right. we know it does not, you know, it's proven. And in insulin, like I, I give people the example that insulin is a fat storage hormone. You know, kids when they get diabetes are skinny. And they have trouble gaining weight because they don't have insulin when they're a type one diabetic. And the first thing that I see as a physician when I, someone has to go on insulin is they gain weight because that's what <laughs> yeah. does in our bodies. But it sounds like you've done so much research on your own uh, with Jason Fung. And then what about Diet Doctor? Because again, a lot of people don't know about this amazing site. Yeah, so dietdoctor.com, um, there, there are resources there. There are people who use the program that you can sign up for two-week meal program. So if you're new to keto and maybe you're not super internet savvy, um, you can sign up and have it laid out for you. They have uh, a wealth of video resources from doctors and professionals all over the world. They're not even based in North America. They're based in Europe. And like they're just, they're constantly pursuing the next bit of information that's in context to all this information and learning and presenting the information they they're present on social media um, sharing other people's transformation stories and so um, between you know recipe resources content information about fasting what to eat what not to eat that you name it they have it visual resource guides on what to eat um, it's just everything you could possibly need to know to get started on either low carb keto or fasting, it's on there. It's it's a fabulous resource. I just happened to stick with the Jason Fung route and kind of stayed off that path, but that's where it all started and because he's involved with them as well. Yeah, it's a great resource. So in Canada, like there are a number of physicians like myself who are part of the low carb uh, clinicians for health, for nutrition, because we know that food is medicine, which is what you've said. Right. And so this is the number one resource too that we refer people to. And I think it's important too, Stephanie, like you've probably seen through the years, there's so many like fad websites and everything else. But what I like as a physician with diet doctor is we put evidence-based medicine and you can look for, yeah. you know, podcasts from some of the greatest researchers like, you know, Dr. Fang on there. Yeah, exactly. No. And, um, no, you, like you said, fad websites, it's not even just websites. You're getting more and more fad products now with stickers on it that says, keto certified by keto certified.com and it's like who is keto certifying anything <laughs> keto is not a product it's a metabolic state and oh my goodness it's just and i find it's probably going to get worse and worse and worse as the years come because companies have picked up on the fact that people realize how well this works and so they're trying to make a a, a mint off of it but keto is free fasting is free low carb is free <laughs> all these things are free <laughs> Well, it's like when they put advertising for gluten-free. So it's on a can of fruit and it says gluten-free. You know, it's like, of course, there's never. Yeah, I'm so glad this banana is gluten-free. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but honestly, even, uh, so speaking of labels though and packaging, these keto approved packaged products got me in trouble this year because they weren't something I used to eat. And then when I, w I won some giveaways on Instagram and they got me in trouble and derailed and inflamed again and all these gut health issues, going back to my initial celiac diagnosis, same kind of thing happened with gluten-free stuff. And what I later found out was that most gluten-free replacement foods are heavy, heavy, heavy in corn and corn is crazy inflammatory too. And so I found I ended up 
probably even more inflamed after a few years of eating a heavy gluten-free approved junk packaged product. So it's not just keto, you know, anything that is an alternate way of eating, but it's supposed to be based on real whole foods. They start slapping labels on it. There's just no way. There's no way it's a good choice. It can't be. And that's why I encourage people to take a whole food approach to health. Yeah. You know, if it's got more than three ingredients on the label, or even if it has a label, you don't want to be buying yeah. it, uh, which I find too can simplify things for individuals. It takes a while to get it out of their head. Yeah. You know, you shop around the outskirts of the, sh- of the grocery store and you really don't, you rarely have to go down the aisles if you're it's eating. true. But for years, how many times did I hear that? But it's like my brain subconsciously was saying, but what does it, what does that actually look like? Because it's one thing to say, oh, shop, yeah, you know, and we know that now, but when you're in the thick of obesity, that's such a foreign concept, you know, or uh, I remember people would say, well, you just need to listen to your body. And I think, do they have any idea what it's like to be a binge eater, an obese binge eater <laughs> with a whole host of medical issues to know what it even means to listen to my body in an effective or appropriate way? Not even a little bit, just not even. When your hormones are so messed up, your triggers for true physical hunger versus just habitual hunger are, are fried. And, and more so I found my satiety hormones it took a while for those to get on point. Once they did and you start to eat and even if there's one bite left, your brain and your body say, no, I'm done. Such a strange place to arrive to because it's not a place I had ever been. I didn't know that feeling until I did. And now that I do, it's earth shattering the the difference of knowing that concept of finish what's on your plate versus eat until you are, I like what uh, Dr. Ken Berry says, eat until you are comfortably stuffed. You know, not until you're going to vomit, not until you think you've eaten an appropriate serving. Eat for proper hunger, eat until you're comfortably full and then stop, but don't snack. If you, if you feel the need to snack two, two hours later, you didn't fuel yourself properly at that meal. So it has taken a long time. And, you know, sometimes you get off the wagon, you eat ridiculous for a little while, and then it takes a bit to get those hormones communicating properly again. But it's such a, a win when you can get to the place that you know what it feels like to be done, to be satisfied, and to stop eating. And what does that process look like, Stephanie? Because a lot of people say exactly that. I don't know where to begin. So if you go back and you look at yourself, you know, and you say in the beginning, what I wish I had known. Yeah. And what I think, what I was doing in the beginning and didn't really realize it at the time, it's what I was doing and why it was working. But now I can tell people when you start, your hormones are not going to be healthy or even turned on the right direction. And so it's not about fasting in the beginning. It's not about how frequently you eat in the beginning. When you're used to eating a standard American diet or you're used to eating a lot of carbs, I recommend for as long as it takes, maybe it's the first five days and then you feel good. Maybe it takes two weeks, maybe it takes 30 days. Eat when you need to. So when you wake up in the morning, if you're ravenous, and all you want is waffles, go ahead and fry up an egg, have it, eat. If you go to the gym at seven o'clock at night and you come home and you say, I really don't want to eat this late, but you are genuinely hungry, eat. Keep the foods on the low carb list. The lower the carb, the better, especially at the beginning. And if it takes a week of literally eating from sun up to sundown to not feel crazy, as long as it's those low carb foods, it's fine. Eventually you will realize that you don't need to eat after the gym. So that one drops off. Maybe another week goes by and you think you're having your coffee and you think, I don't, I don't really feel like I need breakfast right now. Awesome. And eventually, you know, three meals and three snacks will become three meals and no snacks. And it just kind of gradually happens from there if you allow it. I definitely don't recommend going cold turkey right out the gate. I know some people who after a disastrous holiday will say, I'm going to fast for the next three days. And it's like, 
good luck with that because you're going to feel like trash. <laughs> and so just eat, eat the right foods, but just eat as you need to eat until that feeling of ravenous crazy settles down a bit and then kick off one of your snacks because really we don't need to be snacking because every time we put food in our mouths, it triggers that insulin response, which triggers fat storage. So, you know, at the beginning, so just by switching what you're eating, you're going to make massive impacts. And then in time, cut back on how frequently you're eating. Some people are three square meals a day, people even on keto, and that's fine. But maybe in the beginning, they were having a bunch of snacks. And once the snacks were cut down, that drastically helped. Because I mean, um, you know, the whole breakfast is the most important meal of the day. I always chuckle because you get two sides of it. One who believes it wholeheartedly and the other who says, oh, that's been debunked. But then I laugh and I say, but in all fairness, the first meal of the day that you eat is breakfast, regardless of what time of day it is, or if it's the only meal you eat that day, it's still breakfast. <laughs> Actually, that's really good. I've never really, because you're still breaking your fast. Right. Is breakfast is called. Yeah. Um, but for me, that was the biggest point because I, you know, I studied nutrition. I'm a nutritionist before I went into medicine. And so it was always like having three meals a day and two snacks. Yeah. And it never really made sense for a lot of people. And it's so how we've basically become programmed, right? And that's the trouble with our society, that mm -hmm. we're programmed to have these meals plus these snacks plus a bed lunch, and that, but this is not working. And if we actually just take a spin on that, you know, and I encourage, you know, um, you know, doctors that I work with, dietitians to work with, that everybody is a little bit different. You know, the way that we process things, the way we process carbs, the way we process fats, and for many individuals, especially in modern society, we see it that we can't be having these small frequent meals. It causes too much um, inflammation and, and the weight gain. Yeah. But I mean, one of my first experiences with realizing early on, and it didn't click till later, but at the time realizing on paper that the dietary recommendations were crazy was when I had gestational diabetes. So with my first pregnancy, I didn't. With the second pregnancy, I did. And so I was forced into the diabetic clinic, which meant every week I was meeting with an endocrinologist. And when they asked us to write down what we ate and said each meal times three is between 45 to 60 carbs, each snack times three is 15 to 30 carbs. I did the math and I said, that's 270 carbs a day. I was not low carb at the time. I did not know what keto was. I had never heard the word in 2015, 16. And yet I wrote down what I ate for that week. And at the time I was still working for and attending a gym who also the, the primary coaches are trained in precision nutrition for nutrition coaching. So I had a nutrition coach at the time and they were saying, no, that's crazy. So, I mean, I went from eating like junk while pregnant to then being diagnosed gestational diabetic to having to log what I was eating and even logging what I was eating. I was coming in around hundred to 120 total carbs per day and I showed it to the nutritionist at my first meeting I said I've written this down for one week I will not keep writing it down I'm aware of what spikes my blood sugar and I won't eat those things I'm not going to eat 60 carbs per meal three times a day I don't believe I'm damaging my baby to cut back and I lost 28 pounds during that pregnancy not gain you know, unfortunately, uh, the second I was no longer pregnant, I said, "Woohoo! I'm not gestational diabetic anymore. And when I would have got a French vanilla iced cappuccino from Tim Hortons, which has 62 carbs in it. So, <laughs> and then I kind of lost control again until the blood clots. And then now we know where I'm at, but I mean, things were starting to not make sense in the endocrinologist world and hormone world. And things were just already bubbling forward even from that time, because it just didn't sound right. It didn't make sense to bring your sugars and weight down to eat not only that many carbs, but just that much food. It just seemed like too much and I couldn't do it. And that's why, you know, when people go low carb and we can see the work, especially if, you know, diet doctor, but Verda Health, I mean, you've probably seen Verda, you know, out of California and they're reversing diabetes. Yeah. And, you know, we can reverse pre-diabetes and diabetes. And yeah. you know, all the things that we talk about, and you know, we talk about cancer and people think, oh, if I only had a cure for cancer. Well, we don't have a cure, but guess what? We know that so many cancers are linked to obesity. Right. And, you know, we can actually, we can reverse a lot of the negative side effects yeah. of obesity because it's not the weight, right? It's the inflammation, it's the diabetes, yeah. it's the raised cancer markers, the lower inflammation. So 
if you're worried about cancer, think about your weight, think about how you can be as healthy as you can. And then that can actually start this cascade of, of making people feel better. Exactly. And I mean, my husband also does keto, low carb and intermittent fasting. We absolutely do not eat at the same time. We don't eat the same foods and we didn't start for the same reason. He actually is a cancer survivor. Um, he had melanoma in 2012 removed and, um, his father died of pancreatic cancer 10 years ago. His sister had breast cancer. And so he knows now the impact of the excess weight and higher sugars on it. And he also had been on a prescription drug, uh, quetiapine, which was in conjunction with his antidepressants. And that drug in itself is known to cause increased you know, A1C, which it had. And so we got him off the drug. Now he eats keto, he, he fasts also because he works overnights. So he has, you know, being a night shift worker against him. But the cancer was one of his primary reasons because he said, you know, I'm approaching 50 years old. My father died of pancreatic cancer. I don't want that. And so we should, I think our probably one of our next reading list is gonna be the cancer code by Jason Fung, because, you know, he just has such a good way at presenting the information. And if we can spread that message too, great. You know, like there's so, there's so many people that given, it's like when I play the piano and when someone says, play me a song, I sit at the piano and say, I can't think. And so all these people will come to mind later who have just like spoken to me and influenced me. And, um, you know, and I just hope that people are paying attention and hearing the, the pieces that they need to hear that day and knowing it's not the impossible dream. I've seen people lose 300 pounds and still counting on Instagram. And, you know, it's, it's just so possible and we can change the face of treatment. We can change the face of cholesterol conversations and cardiovascular disease. Like there's just, I was just dismissed, not dismissed, discharged from an endocrinologist because there's nothing wrong with me. So I think it's exciting. You'll be working with endocrinology. That's really cool. Well, it's great to see people when they can be transformed. And I know now like hormones and hormone health and we've got, that's what we are, you know? Mm -hmm. um, why, you know, it's so funny because cholesterol gets a bad rap, but our hormones are made from cholesterol. So we actually need a little bit. <laughs> we I know I, fr I freaked my doctors out a little bit with my numbers though. <laughs> It's come to, come to find out I was at the time a, a, a hyper responder, but it's all fine now, but it's, I was still in the fat loss phase. And so it skewed the digits. Um, but I'll never forget the day I got my labs back. And that was one of them. And my doctor was just saying, he's like, I don't understand. He said, what am I supposed to tell you? Stop getting healthy. He said, you're doing everything right, but your numbers are weird. Not bad. He said, they're, they're weird. And I said, oh, well, what's my, I said, what's my A1C? He bellowed, he laughed out loud and he said, it's 4.4, <laughs> which was amazing. <laughs> like, you know, we want it to be under 5.5, preferably five or below, but it was 4.4. And uh, he, he literally just laughed out loud. He said, I don't even know what to do with you other than to say, good job, I don't know. <laughs> I mean, he had watched my journey. He'd been my doctor since 2003. So he had only ever known me as obese. And so he watched this all unfold. And then the final steps before he moved on to work at the hospital in geriatrics was actually um, me getting approved for my skin removal surgery. Um, so it was nice. He got to sort of see it to the end and then he's moved on. But I'll, I'll just I'll never forget the laughter that came out of him when he saw that my, my uh, CRP, my inflammatory markers were rock bottom and my high sensitivity CRP was rock bottom and just my triglycerides my hdl were all pristine and all these things it was just so he said i'm going to send you to an endocrinologist and then he that doctor said well can i send your information to some of my colleagues at dell med school i said sure <laughs> like an hour after talking to him he said i should probably go i have more patients to see but we just talked for an hour i gave him information on um ivor cummings from the UK and he was taking all these notes and I think he was just as fascinated as I was but, it's but he also didn't put me on any medications because he knew that's not the route he said when you walked into my office he said full disclosure when you walked into this office 
based on only your labs and not knowing you or your story, I assumed it would be a five minute appointment. I thought you would walk in and I would say, you have familial hypercholesterolemia, high cholesterol runs in your family, have a good day, here's a statin. And he looked at me and he said, that is not the case at all. You do not have that. Um, he was like, who are you? <laughs> Where did you come from? Why are your labs like this? <laughs> And he phoned me um, a couple weeks ago, just as a follow up. And he was like, I, I feel like I don't need to keep your file open. There's nothing wrong with you. So done. <laughs> and more people like yourself, you know, Stephanie, and then more doctors like myself that, that teach it and can guide patients. And this is how we can transform, right? Because we know obesity is an epidemic. We know cancer. We know anxiety. And we could talk about all of the consequences of sure. food because it goes much more than weight. Oh, absolutely. Um, but it's messages like ours that we can share. But one thing is, would you mind telling people though, how much you, what did you start at and where are you now weight wise? Cause some people, yeah, those numbers. sure. No. So I started at 330 and I had been that weight a long time because like I said, in my pregnancy, so I gave birth to two babies at 300 pounds. So 330 pounds, three years ago in the first year, literally 12 months, I lost 150 pounds. After that, I went completely dairy free and I lost a little bit more, but I don't believe it was sustainable and where my body was going to stay. I think it just had to do with dairy inflammation. Um, then two surgeries, two years in a row has sort of set me back a little bit. I'm a little over 200 pounds right now. So we're correcting that. Um, I know where I felt most optimized and where I felt best in my clothing. I had to wait for the full one year mark because of muscle repair in my stomach to do any heavy lifting and heavy working out plus COVID and gyms being shut down. So we're working to get back to where I was comfortable, which was 170. So I had lost 160 pounds and was maintaining there until the surgeries happened. And so I almost feel like I could just take that as a blip off the radar because it's not, it's almost like it's not relevant. You know, when someone says I gained 10 pounds over the weekend because I had beer and nachos, but we know that that's not permanent. That's, that's not permanent. So it's, I, it's almost like it's not relevant. I try to look at the bigger picture. So, I mean, effectively though, from 330 pounds, lost 150. I went into surgery this year at 185 pounds also. So that was a comfortable place for me. So we're on a pursuit to sort of get back there and then learn what maintenance looks like without surgeries. <laughs> and it's wonderful. And you know, that you've gone through that and you know that setbacks are okay because that's it. It's a setback. Of course I had surgery, things are different. <laughs> you know, inflammation is going to be higher than I can't lose weight if I'm inflamed. And like we said too, even the anxiety and my cortisol was, has been so high this year. My son had surgery this year. I had surgery this year. My daughter broke her arm. My mother broke her leg. Like just, you know, between COVID and life, life happens and cortisol gets up and then you're just stuck because until you can get that stress level down, your body's going to say, mm -mm, nope, not right now. <laughs> So that's a reality. <laughs> and that's why, you know, one of the things I really focus on is trying to get people to sleep because they say, if you're not sleeping, your cortisol is high. So your, your weight loss, it's going to be so tough on you. Yeah. Let's kind of work on, you know, a bit of stress and maybe sleep to get things. Yeah. And I've definitely been trying to get to bed earlier. For me, the gym used to be in the evenings, partly because it just worked for our family schedule. Um, my husband works nights, so he sleeps during the day and I would go to the gym at night, but I found I burnt out and I was tired and I wasn't getting enough sleep because by the time I came down from the endorphins and then unwound and got to bed, it was like 11 o'clock ish at night. And then my alarm goes off. I have two small kids to get ready for school. It wasn't working for me. So now I've made some different arrangements and I try to go by supper time so that I'm home having a bath with my lavender and unwinding much earlier. Although it means I'm home for what I call the witching hour with small children. It's, you know, you have to pick your battles. And right now I'd rather put up with that than being out too late and not able to unwind at an appropriate hour. And then just being up too late. I just can't, I'm too old for that. <laughs> what well, sounds like one of the things, Stephanie, that we spoke on a little earlier though, is that knowing your body and it sounds like since this journey started for you that you're much more aware truly now of what your body and what it needs. I think it's very cool that you can be in tune with your body. Um, as a female and as a female who has had pregnancies and babies, 
I became quite gifted at being in tune with my reproductive body and things and signs and signals. And so it's not much different, you know, as a female, I think we should know those things, but also as a human, we should be learning and be in tune with signals and cues and triggers. And it's, it's an ongoing process though. I mean, I'm still learning what triggers food behaviors and what actually gives me a complete satiety that carries into the next day versus hours. And, and you know what, we, we change our cycles change as females, we have a cycle, you know, men have hormones too. And so depending on where we're at in that cycle, it's going to dictate what our needs are too. And so it's never, it's a never ending battle because every year you get older, your hormones change. So it's like, you can't ever nail it down completely, but you have to be willing to put in the work. Yeah, that's it. It's all about the cycles, right? And that, that ebb and flow, which is what life is about. So Stephanie, as we kind of get ready to wrap things up, it's been so great to hear your story today. Like I'll share some of this in the notes about, you know, your journey, you know, the lactose, the celiac diet, Dr. Jason Fung, um, that it's got to be the food. I love that quote that you said. Uh, mm -hmm. As we get ready to leave, I guess first is how can people connect with you? Sure. So I am actively present on social media. Um, Facebook and Instagram is Stephalopagus, <laughs> uh, a nickname I got back in high school, kind of a cross between Stephanie and Snuffleupagus from Sesame Street. Um, but I do share daily on there. I'm always open. People want to reach out to me privately. If they're not comfortable commenting publicly, I, I respond to everybody, unless it's spam. <laughs> um, but I'm happy to, to chat. I'm happy to share more details of my story about my surgeries too. I don't mind people asking me. Nothing's too private for me, literally. I have women who ask me questions about all sorts of things. Men also. You name it, I'll answer it. So wonderful. It's such an inspiration to hear from you so many. And I guess today, just as we finish, if you could leave us, you know, because you've been through such a journey, what does wellness mean to you? What does it mean to feel well? To feel well for me means that I don't wake up grumpy and agitated, feeling like I didn't sleep. It means having a foot race down my driveway with my kids and winning. It means setting a good example for my kids by what I put on my plate or not put on my plate, you know, for just being open about health and body and prescriptions without it being a shaming thing. You know, we're very careful in our home not to put down weight and bodies because we have kids who are listening. So wellness for me is to feel optimized in my body. Wonderful message. Thank you so much, Stephanie, for being here today. I can't wait to get this message out to the world. I appreciate chatting. It was so nice to see you face to face. I'm jealous of Bermuda, but it's okay. <laughs> Take care. Thanks. I hope you're inspired by Stephanie's story. Continue to follow her on Facebook and Instagram, another health hero.